Good morning and welcome to the SUNY Online Summit. We are thrilled to be back in person with some of us here in Syracuse uh, this year. And uh, many of you will remember that the last time this event was in person was in February of 2020. Uh, and as we all went home, the world shut down, right? So uh, we have continued on with virtual summits the last couple of years, but we are really, really thrilled to be here in person with those of you who are here. We have about 80 folks here uh, who have registered to be here in person with us in Syracuse, but we have more than 500 people who are also joining us virtually. And in true uh, um, uh, you know, spirit of the online community, we are doing this in a high flex way so that people can participate in person or virtually. I know some of you are here today, you'll be virtual later in the week or you're virtual today, you'll be here later in the week. So we're really thrilled to, to be able to do this. And uh, I wanna really thank the folks, uh, the Center for Professional Development and the hotel staff. I think Brendan's been working overtime to get all the technology working. Um, and again, we're just thrilled for everybody who is, is joining us. Uh, so as we get started today, um, I want to just acknowledge that we have both SUNY and non-SUNY folks here. We have, um, uh, you know, great to be able to have people outside of the SUNY community join us for this event. Uh, and, uh, um, and I think we have a really fabulous program. I want to um, give a shout out to um, Alexander Pickett, the SUNY online team, and the uh, directors of online learning, and many other folks who have been involved in the planning of this event. I think you're going to be really pleased, as you always are, with who we've brought to the table and the conversations and the dialogue that are gonna happen. Uh, so I'm gonna uh, kind of jump right in to get us started. We're starting with an update from SUNY System Administration and SUNY Online. And you have a kind of triumvirate here of um, our provost in charge, myself and Dan Feinberg. Um, and I'll introduce us uh, uh, each as, as we go through. Um, but you know, there's a lot happening uh, in SUNY these days. Uh, it's been a really busy year, so we have a lot to share with you and uh, a lot to uh, hopefully get you really excited about. Uh, um, to, to get us started, I'm really pleased to be able to introduce our provost in charge, Shadi Sandrick. And Shadi has been uh, in this role and with us for the last three years, um, uh, actually two years. This is her third summit with us. Uh, and, um, and again, great to be here in person, but I just want to say that that I've had the distinct pleasure of working with Shadi closely over the last couple of years. She comes from the faculty uh, here at SUNY, uh, and she uh, has been uh, our advocate and our champion in the provost office at SUNY System Administration. She really understands, I think, the issues of both the campuses and uh, the system office and has helped us navigate the challenges of the last couple of years um, incredibly well. I've been grateful for her support and really grateful that she's able to spend some time with us today. So um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Shadi Sandvik, who is our provost in charge. And let me just get her slides up here. Uh, I have to unshare and share. Is that correct? Did I stop sharing already? I did. Okay. Share. And then, oops. taxing my technology skills. All right, here we go. <laughs> okay. I'm... Hi, everyone. Yeah. Welcome. <laughs> it's really exciting to see everybody in person. I have had the pleasure of addressing uh, the conference the past two years, and this is the third one. And it's um, it's fantastic to see this year is the year that every time I'm in conferences now after the in my third year, and I say it's so fantastic to see people face to face. There's just and some folks you probably have realized their 2D and 3D are different. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's another revelation. Oh, you look like you're 2D. Um, so I am so glad to be here and welcome. Uh, this is going to be a fantastic conference as I have just scanned over the agenda. It's packed full of really uh, important talks, but also workshops. So I'm sure that you're, you're in it for a treat. And welcome to our, well, 
Welcome to our SUNY folks here, but definitely the non-SUNY. We're so glad that some of you are able to attend in person and many of you are online. Um, I am a big believer in what SUNY online, online education and what it, it is able to accomplish and how we can, especially what I have seen in the past couple of years from our own work, SUNY online team and our SUNY campuses is how innovation starts from the, the online folks and it just kind of seeps into the rest of the life of the campus. And before we know it, it's, it's adopted large scale. So it's fantastic to see how these small scale grants turn into something that's really big. Um, so before I get so excited about and tell you about all these things, I have to acknowledge a couple of people. So I'll do that before I forget because they are really just the backbone of what makes, uh, makes all of this tick. Uh, so many thanks to Alex Pickett, um, which I learned today that she conducted the first conference, two campuses, and how many people, Alex? Well, the first SUNY online summit was me and two people in my office. <laughs> <laughs> 1995 or six. So for folks online that may not hear um, Alex, the first SUNY online summit was in 1996 with two campuses and two people or three people. So it's fantastic to just see the strength of this community coming together and it's in 24th year, I think, of this being conducted. So thanks to Alex, uh, Kim Scalzo, who is for folks that they work with Kim, uh, they know that she is the biggest advocate that you could have for the impact of um, online teaching and learning and its impact on many things that are our priorities and chancellor's priorities. So thanks to Kim for her continued leadership. Marianne Hassan, the chief of staff in the office of provost. Dan Feinberg, Dan sitting there. Where are you, Dan? Dan, uh, the entire SUNY online team, thank you for everything that you all do and you do it so well. And do it all and many other um, who, again, they're involved in putting together a great program today and every day. Um, and this is definitely very timely and um, very relevant to many of the topics that is important again for online learning, but for many things that we do. So let me jump right into um, our chancellor's priorities. So for um, many of our SUNY folks, but definitely for our non-SUNY folks, we are so pleased to have our chancellor, um, Dr. John King on board. Uh, he joined us um, the first, the beginning of January, and it's amazing um, ev everything that has been happening in literally two months. Um, so here you see Chancellor's priorities, which are so um, in line with what we do. It's, this is what we do, but it's just so beautifully packaged so we can actually try to align what we do to these priorities. Student success, diversity, equity, inclusion, research and scholarship, economic development and upward mobility. And for the first time in the, in the history of SUNY system, Chancellor has created an office of student success. And we hired the first senior vice chancellor for student success who leads that, that office to make sure that we put special emphasis in the provost office and many of the things that we do in, in, in collaboration with our campuses has been about student success. Um, Further emphasis on that um, is, is what we are hoping as we move forward. Okay, so I want to connect these. It's, it's, I think it's intuitive for you to kind of think about these priorities and try to see SUNY online or just online learning in each of these. So, but I like to just maybe tie it um, some of, to some of the examples. So I tie these priorities to some of the examples um, that you all have been working on, but let me go to this one because I, again, as I said in the beginning, I really believe the top of my slide is cut, but it's okay, you can still see it. Innovation ecosystem, and that's supposed to be response. Let me just see what it is. I can't stop sharing, but it's okay. 
it's how we SUNY online or, or just online learning, this innovation ecosystem not only reacts to the forces, it's I, okay. I, I, thank you. Um, so you don't necessarily want be, to be in a situation that on a daily basis, like what happened to all of us during COVID, that you need to suddenly react to the situation that you're facing. And you guys reacted so well, right? You want to have this ecosystem that not it's, it's agile. Um, and that is really about the processes that you have put in place. So you respond to those needs, but you also always think about the next step and innovation, right? So in an innovation ecosystem, you're constantly trying to look at these external forces and internal forces. And for us, I've just looked at some of them, state and national calls for equity, changing labor market needs, technology innovation, cybersecurity threats that many of us have to deal with, or these internal forces from within SUNY, increasing student diversity, varied instructional models, new DLE that, that it's being, um, uh, across SUNY, we are changing our DLE. Um, policies for EIT accessibility, security, many other things. So I just listed some of them. So if, there has to be a way that you respond constantly. If you want to stay in the game, you need to be able to respond, but also innovate so that you're thinking a couple of steps ahead. And it's wonderful to just look at in this case, SUNY Online in its totality and say, what, what are we doing to be responsive, but to innovate? So we continue to be relevant and impactful from pedagogical trends and responding to those challenges, for example, student retention and completion to techno technological innovation, such as early alert, which is just the most fantastic example that's so easy to just look at that and how that has seeped into the rest of the campus. Um, online readiness assessment tools to IITG projects and seed grants such as Starfish. Um, and let me just stop and give you an example. I was talking to Ed, where are you Ed back? Okay, right there. And it's wonderful, Ed was telling me about an IITG grant that they got on campus. Ed, was it two years ago? I think about two years ago. Um, um, and it's called SUNY, Ed remind me. SUNY Create. If you don't know about SUNY Create, make sure to stop Ed and ask him about it. It's a really great example of why the small grant has resulted into multiple campuses working together on, on that and pulling in students um, to scaling innovation projects such as PIP Early Alerts Project and SUNY Online Degrees at Scale um, Success Coaches uh, to fact two task groups. And I tell you, I think all of you know about fact two, I have, I am just on daily basis, I am impressed by the dedication of this group and how the innovation and the thinking that comes out of that group, again, seeps into the rest of the community and we adopt them. So fantastic. So some of those are responses to these needs, these forces, but some of these forces, we don't even know what they are, but we need to create this very, robust backbone to be able to respond to it. And I think we are ready. So putting this together and now that ecosystem, what happens is that based on that, then we have UI strategies like proactive student support for online students to UI policy and standards like SUNY online um, and personalized student services to UI infrastructure, the like contract for Starfish. I mean, you know it, but I emphasize again, just the ability of SUNY to act as one body. I mean, what it gives us in be, to be able to negotiate contract um, that every, if, if every single campus had to do it, it's amazing how costly it would be and how impossible it would be for some of our campuses. But building on that power of system working together, this is what you're able to do. And all of these, we constantly have to think about that these are for student success and that will happen when we support our faculty and our staff. Our faculty need professional development to be able to kind of come to that level that they can impact student success. So all of it undergird by dissemination of what comes out of these groups, professional development, communities of practice, shared services, and on and on. 
So I'll let Kim get into some of those examples, uh, but I have, I think I had 10 minutes, but I think I'm taking way more. So I am just going to tell you if I can actually advance. Oh, so, so people were actually not seeing what I was no, saying. They were. <laughs> I'm just going to stop and start again. Okay. Yes. So it's good to, I'm just going to show you a snapshot of how, um, what's the growth of online offering at SUNY. Um, it's really quite amazing uh, what, what is happening uh, pre pandemic, where we were, and what pandemic almost like forced us to do, and uh, where we are today. Okay. Uh, so let me just, jump to here and then I'll go back and tell you a little bit about something that you're just quite excited about. So here's fall enrollment by online status. Um, in pink, kind of salmon color, it, uh, the, these are students that are exclusively online and in like, the orangish color, it's not all online, so it's a hybrid. And then blue is all, um, all in person, so not online. And just look at the growth for students that are either hybrid or fully online. It's quite amazing that in 2012, we were in 20,000 for exclusively online to where we went during the pandemic time to almost like 200,000 students, quite amazing. And then we are at 76,000 students. That's a lot. And I think there's no going back. This is going to continue to grow and it's really upon us and you all to continue to innovate. We need to be responsive, of course, to the needs, but also innovate. How can we get more? It's about, I mean, I look at equity as this is how you do equity. This is how you enable students to be able to be successful by offering, meeting them where, where they are. Okay, so let me, this is a, again, just to kind of put in a number of growth in online activity. Uh, online courses annually, and then I have 2019, 2020, and then academic year 21, 22. Um, and what you see is that we went online courses from 25,000 plus. Now we are like 53,000 plus. I mean, that's quite amazing. And that's what is happening on our campuses and what, what you all are enabling to happen. I'm really impressed with looking at students blending online and face-to-face. -face. These are courses in spring ter term, going from 76,000 to over 100,000 courses. Quite amazing. So obviously more courses and programming that are being delivered online and more students are taking advantage of it. Think about micro-credentials. How you can, uh, and, and that's what you're all, I'm sure, thinking about. Take all these lessons learned and from traditional offerings, how uh, we can kind of expand it to reach um, more, more students. So. Online learning obviously continues to be very important. And, and I am sure that you're all there to meet students where they are. So before I end, let me just tell you a little bit about um, this 200,000, 200 million. Last time I said million, billion, and it couldn't be billion. Now it's like 200,000. I'm going a couple orders up and down here, but 200 million. in. Um, in her state of the state, um, our governor, Kathy Hochul, uh, had specified 200 million in her budget, 200 million investment in digital transformation for SUNY. We are super excited about what that means for us. As you all know, you can't do digital transformation with just two, three computers. You need, there's so much that goes into it. If you wanna do innovation, you need the hardware, you need the skilled people to be able to do it. You need the support people. And then everything that you want to do. And I give you one example that I am I'm very excited about. And I think it's going to be extremely helpful to us. And that's data strategy. So for some of our campuses that have been heavily involved in data governance and a data strategy, you know that data strategy is more than data governance. It has a lot to it. It's people that have to support it. It's the open it, that from the top to the bottom, everybody has to adhere to a set of how they define data, where the data exists, how we access data, how do we connect data, 
And all of that is a, how we secure data, how we share it, how we communicate it. There's just so much that's involved in there. And one example of that, DLE, the amount of data that you all have just in your online courses. So to be able to do all of that fantastic work and do strategy based on data, you need all of that to be in place. And your data strategy would be called the hardware and people. So we are so excited about what this 200 million means for SUNY being even more strategic about how we go about the business of SUNY. So I have already taken way more time. I can go on and on, but I'll stop. You have uh, other really exciting things to listen to. And with that, I wanna thank you again for being here and online for participating. This is going to be very exciting. And I am happy to answer any questions. Otherwise, enjoy the conference. Thank you. Shadi, before you go, there was one question in the chat. Hi, this is John Zelenek. Um, Laura wanted to know if the numbers that you shared were from all of the 64 campuses combined. Yes. Thank you. Absolutely. Any other softball question for me? <laughs> All right, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Shadi. I hope that was helpful to get kind of that, uh, you know, um, high level view of what's happening at SUNY and uh, what we're doing. All right, now let me see if I can get the right PowerPoint open. This one. And I really, I'm, I'm, I'm just so excited to be able to build on what Chadi was talking about. And before I get this going, so Brendan, if I hit this arrow, will these go away? How about if I do, yeah, I think it says close. All right, let me just, oh, okay, I'll leave that up there. And then I wanna get rid of these. Does anybody remember how I did that? Ah, here we go. Oh, now I'm not being shared. Okay, I'll get there. Give me a second. Share, share, share. Oh, yeah, let's do this again. <laughs> this one, right? Hide floating meeting controls. All right, great. Okay, so I am thrilled to be able to, to build on what Shadi was talking about. Um, and for those of you who don't know me, I um, should have introduced myself initially. I'm Kim Scalzo, and I am currently serving as our Hello, everyone. We know that we just lost um, everyone that was online in the room. They are aware we will get everybody back shortly. So please just hang in there with us. We're going to pause the recording. All right. There we go again. So I was talking about we have external and internal forces affecting us. And then uh, this kind of um, flowing diagram shows how when we become aware of pedagogical trends and challenges, oftentimes there are technological innovations to respond to that. And you know, just to go back to the example Shadi gave, early alerts came about because campuses were struggling with student success and how to be proact how to proactively intervene when students were falling behind. Um, how do we monitor what they're doing and be able to proactively intervene? So based on those technological innovations, we often see projects coming in from SUNY campuses through our IITG program, 
other seed grant opportunities that we have across, across the system. And that's really where innovation, a lot of our innovation starts at the grassroots faculty and staff level, which we love. When we see projects that are successful, we have the opportunity to scale them up. And we've done that with investments at the SUNY level with things like PIF. There's also been opportunities for external investment from places like the Gates Foundation or Lumina. Um, and then oftentimes we see outcomes of that work or sometimes in parallel make their way into the fact two task groups as Shadi was talking about. So, so those are some of the key pieces of our innovation ecosystem where we start from these very small ideas um, uh, uh, and that become really big ideas. And then we were able to take them to scale and demonstrate that they work. One of the conversations I was having this morning, I'm gonna to point to my friend Ed Beck again, was about sustainability, right? How do things really become sustainable? How do we make sure that that great idea, even though we scaled it up, um, is supported, is enabled and able to continue? So we have to think about how it aligns. When things align with our strategy at the university-wide level, there's more likelihood that it's gonna get support at the system level and from our campus leaders, by the way. Um, oftentimes there are opportunities for university-wide policies and standards. Again, the um, SUNY Online signature elements, which many of you are familiar with, represent how we have codified what we know to be the best practices for ensuring quality in online learning ac across seven key areas, personalized student services being one of them. So we have the SUNY Online Plus standard, we have the OSCAR rubric in the online space, we, um, uh, at the institutional level, we align with the OLC quality scorecard, right? So those are the uh, uh, um, standards and policies that we try to align with. And then it comes down to infrastructure, right? So what is needed from a foundational perspective to make sure that we can actually support that strategy to help campuses with that strategy and to support those policies and standards. And that's both, I think, a SUNY responsibility as well as a campus leadership responsibility, right? So. Um, so when we can bring our strategy, policy, and infrastructure, when they are all aligned, then we have a higher likelihood that things will actually be sustained. Another really important piece of the ecosystem are the university-wide programs and services that we are able to bring to the table around innovation initiatives. And um, uh, I want to um, uh, just come back to some of these are in the provost's office but many of them are outside of the provost's office. We work really closely because our focus is digital innovation. We work really closely with our IT partners in other parts of uh, the university and they're, they're important collaborators. We rely on them for a lot of that infrastructure. Uh, and so we all come to the table for things that result in um, you know, professional development. We build and sustain communities of practice. This is oftentimes where shared services either come up as new shared services or inform how our current shared services evolve to meet the changing needs of our campuses. So I'm really excited. Uh, you know, somebody asked me today, how are you liking your new gig? And uh, I'm loving it. Uh, and mostly because this is where I get to really try and focus now and where I wanna be able to work with all of you at the campus level to take innovations through this ecosystem and have the impact that we know we all can have. Okay. So I've mentioned this a couple of times, digital innovation and academic services. So what does that mean? It's basically, a, I represent a portfolio within the provost's office. Uh, and so what are we responsible for? Um, so leading the digital transformation of the SUNY student experience. So Shadi mentioned that um, we have a new senior vice chancellor for student success, for which we're all thrilled about. And I really look forward to partnering with Donna Linderman is her name. Uh, to say, to, to think about how we can bring digital platforms to the table to support the initiatives that, that um, are gonna be um, emphasized and prioritized a, as part of her work here at SUNY. I wanna make sure that, and our team wants to make sure that we align university-wide digital platforms for student success in support of those system-wide strategies and priorities, right? The chancellor has laid out priorities. There are gonna be strategies that come under them as we work through all of this with the chancellor and his new leadership team. And we're gonna be looking to align our platforms to those priorities and strategies. One of the things that I think we do so well in uh, SUNY Online and across the other um, uh, uh, entities that are part of digital innovation and academic services, and I'll talk about those in a minute, um, is we engage with the campuses. You know, We work really closely with communities of practice and, uh, and I think we're, we will continue to do that and bridge 
uh, the work that's happening on the campuses with our partners at the system level to um, facilitate innovation, really with a focus on teaching and learning with technology that continues to be our focus and how we wanna impact student success. And then finally, establish and provide university-wide shared services. So the units in digital innovation and academic service represent a significant component of our shared services on the academic side. So we're gonna do that to make sure that when we deploy digital platforms, we're not just putting technology out there, that we're providing services around those platforms to help us get the most out of those platforms and to really achieve the impact that, that um, that is the potential they represent. And just a couple examples of that are with the early alerts platform, we uh, um, have the concierge model, uh, uh, and we have the community of practice around that, um, and, uh, and we engage really closely with our vendor partner there to make sure that the community is supported uh, in, in leveraging that platform. Uh, so um, uh, shared services is an important piece of it. So who is Digital Innovation and Academic Services? Of course, that includes SUNY Online, but also the Center for Professional Development, which is a big piece of how we uh, accomplish the dissemination and professional development piece of, our, of our, our organization. Also the Office of Library and Information Services, uh, and um, that includes our OER services work, which is increasingly an important part of what we do. Um, we have an academic innovation initiative um, uh, several innovation initiatives uh, that include our IITG grants, the, our partner, partnership with Coursera, and our FlexSpace Consortium. Uh, and then, of course, the FACT Council, the Faculty Advisory Council on Teaching and Technology. And they, they are an important part of our ecosystem because they, they have tenants out to the campuses um, that we can leverage for all the work that we're trying to do and to bring those incredible task groups together to inform uh, um, the, the, the provost office and what we do here at system. So, so when we say digital innovation and academic services, this is what we mean. This is who is included. And, uh, and I'm just feel privileged to be able to um, lead this group and to work with this team of people. So um, I wanna just give a couple examples of how what we do, um, of how what we've been doing um, plays out in that ecosystem. So you'll remember with the, um, uh, going back to the way to the beginning of the digital learning environment, we said we're going to align with SUNY level policy standards and guidance. And we had three work groups at the system level who identified the policy standards and guidance that we wanted the DLE to be able to align with. And then those, those, those are what are represented in that middle box. And as the work groups on the right hand side, which included both campus and system people, set out to do their work, they have had those policies and standards in mind. Um, I don't pretend to think that all of our work is done. Um, you know, we are still in the middle of this implementation with the DLE, but those are the kind of guiding um, uh, policies and uh, standards that these groups have as they are doing their work. Um, and, and I'll just give a couple other examples of that. So EIT accessibility and universal design for learning meant that we have included universal design for learning in the faculty training for the DLE, right? That's, that's a um, component of the training that all faculty get, kind of the foundational pieces of that. Also, um, we have recognized that EIT accessibility of tools being integrated with the DLE is important. And, uh, and uh, campuses were duplicating this work from campus to campus and doing it, um, uh, um, you know, the way that it was being done was highly variable. So we have pulled that together uh, and put in place a central process for the implementation only. This ultimately will go back to the campuses uh, to enable us to get the tools identified and reviewed without requiring every campus to have to do it for tools that are duplicated. So that's, uh, um, and that may evolve into a shared service. Um, you know, uh, the OSCAR rubric is something that almost all of our campuses are using now to some degree. That was the basis for the creation of the DLE template. So those standards and uh, um, you know, what we know to be good practices have found their way um, as well into the DLE. Open education resources um, is another significant initiative for SUNY. And so um, our team uh, you know, has been working to make sure that that is easily integrated into the DLE. Uh, information security, um, like EIT accessibility, um, that's a requirement that our tools are compliant with our information security requirements. 
Again, something that campuses were doing, um, you know, high degree of vari variability. So we've pulled that together along with EIT accessibility and we're supporting that review centrally. Federation for Identity Management, Global ID, Multi-Factor Authentication and SIS integration. So those are SUNY level standards, policies that we said going into the DLE, we are going to align with. What that meant was that every campus has to have those things in place. That's actually, there's a little bit of work that we do at the system level, but most of that work is actually at the campus level. And I wanna just fully acknowledge and recognize that has meant a tremendous amount of work at the campus level to get there. Um, and some of you are still getting there. And, uh, and there have been struggles and challenges and we know that. Um, and we are continuing to talk about how we support our campuses in getting there. And I really think when we look at that $200 million investment, there are gonna be some opportunities to help our campuses. At least I hope there will be. I, I don't get to say how it's spent, but, but that's what I'm gonna advocate for. Um, to come back to EIT accessibility compliance for the, for the DLE tools. So we brought in um, an EIT accessibility expert. Um, many of you will know the name Mark Greenfield from formerly from the University of Buffalo. He may be online watching. Um, so I just wanna give a shout out to him for helping us really think through everything that we have to do in this space to ensure compliance with tools being integrated into the DLE. So we're establishing um, criteria and a process for reviewing the tools and then actually reviewing the tools. Um, we are having conversations about the concept of trusted sources. So when we get past the initial implementation, right? If, 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 if this is something that everybody has to do, how do we share information about who's doing what and how do we identify sources who trust each other so that if you're reviewing a tool, we don't have to review it and vice versa. So that's something that we're talking about. And there are some campuses um, that are reviewing uh, tools with the same criteria that we have. And so there are, I think, gonna be some great opportunities for that. We're working on a dashboard for tool repositories. So I think, you know, Kemps has been asking um, almost from the beginning, uh, you know, what tools have been reviewed? What status are they, et cetera? So that is in um, process and we're working on the initial visualizations uh, that we're hoping to be able to share out with campuses soon. Um, professional development for campuses. We've heard a lot that campuses want to be able to do this work, but actually don't know all of what it takes to do this or don't have people trained to do it, even if they know what needs to be done. So Mark is working on uh, some professional development opportunities for campuses that we hope will be available in the summer for those campuses that wanna be able to do this themselves. And then ultimately, um, we've asked him to make a recommendation to us on what a shared service might look like. For those campuses that wanna just be able to buy into a service, what would that look like? And we know that there are some campuses that want to do that. So, so we've asked him to, to make that recommendation. Um, on the, whoops, go back. I had the, yeah, the security one here, but I guess not. So we're doing very similar things on the security side. Um, with the exception of the trusted sources, because I think the, the security pieces are just so sensitive that every campus really needs to be um, uh, you know, paying very close attention to that on their own. So we haven't gone into that conversation on the security side yet, um, but everything else uh, that we're doing on EIT accessibility, we're also doing on the security side. Um, so another thing that I wanna um, talk about is uh, how significant this change is for SUNY. And when we went into this, we said, uh, that this is gonna be a collaboration and partnership for change management. And uh, of course the campuses are huge stakeholders and we're bringing all those UI programs to the table to support them. And of course, with our vendor partner D2L. Uh, so what does that mean? And how has that been playing out? So, um, uh, you know, we, 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 we drove a lot of the change early in the project and continue to do, continue to do that from the perspective of those technical requirements, the policies and standards that we're trying to align with. And we really, um, I think that really had to come from the system level because change is hard. But as we move into the post implementation phase for some of the campuses, we really are hoping that campuses will be much um, more active, much more um, uh, driving the change of how DLE gets leveraged, how, uh, how it needs to evolve and improve to work for campuses. Um, we are hearing a lot from you, what's not working well and what is working. Uh, and so that is something that as we move into our um, post uh, implementation phase, 
uh, camp, the campus voice will be much louder and much more significant. Um, and what we want to also do is support the campuses with a change leadership community of practice. So we launched that this uh, late this fall, and uh, we're in the middle of conducting a webinar series for people who want to um, uh, want help in leading change at the campus level. We're sharing some tools with them, and there's also a course in Brightspace that that there are a group of people participating in now. And many many of the campuses are engaged in that. If that's something that your campus is interested in and you haven't heard about, please feel free to reach out to me. I'd be happy to connect you in with that. Um, uh, Andrea Wade, who's the um, former CAO at Monroe uh, and was also at Broome Community College is leading that with Jane Perrin from the Center for Professional Development and they're doing a fabulous job. Um, okay, so what's next? Let me see how I'm doing for time, okay. So what's next? Uh, so Shadi mentioned the chancellor's four priorities and we have the 200 million looming out there. I look forward to being engaged in those conversations with our leadership team and being able to bring campuses to the table for some of those conversations about what is needed at the campus level and how we can support campuses in, uh, in, in working with us to accomplish these priorities. And I just want, I just want to say that um, uh, Brian Digman, who is our CIO, who has been very active in this, is also um, uh, he and I've had many conversations about how we bring the campus voice into that. And I think you're going to see some of that as we go through some of the um, spring community of practice meetings that, that are coming up. I just keep doing this to me. What's next? Okay. Who hasn't heard about chat GPT, right? <laughs> so, uh, you know, everybody is talking about generative AI as the next disruptor of higher ed. Um, and, and I think it's something we all need to be paying attention to. Uh, there are a couple of sessions here today that are going to touch on that today all today alex or today and tomorrow i can't remember today yeah uh so you know um i encourage you all if, if that's not something that you have thought about or considered or tried to think about what does this mean you really probably want to do that because i think it is going to be very significant and i you know um uh uh there are tremendous opportunities that it represents there's also a lot of fear around it, but honestly, the best advice that we have is to um, uh, learn, understand, think about it, right? And think about what does it mean? We are working on, some of our campuses have hosted webinars on this uh, with their own faculty and others. Uh, we are also working on um, an event that we will uh, um, uh, host later this semester. Yes? Maybe, I don't know, we're talking about it. So um, so we may do something later this semester at the system level, um, but I just wanna encourage everybody to really think about this and what it means. Okay, the DLE implementation is continuing, as I mentioned, uh, there's much more work to be done there and, uh, um, and, and much more um, opportunity uh, you know, to, to do that in a way that supports campus needs. Um, I'm thrilled to be able to say that we are reopening the um, call for proposals as a public call for proposals for um, IITG funding. IITG, again, is the Innovative Instruction Technology Grants. And so those are out there for SUNY faculty and staff to apply to. Um, deadline, Chris? Oh, it was last month. It's not open. Sorry. The proposals are in. The proposals are in. So we are, we're going to be reviewing them. That's what's coming up. Thank you, Chris. Sorry. Um, and then we're also already having conversations about what the next back to task groups will be. So again, coming back to that fact advisory council and how they can help and think about some of these things. Maybe, you know, do we have a task group around AI? Do we, you know, what, what else is happening that we want to think about? And I think hearing, you know, what some of the activities are from the chancellor's priorities may also inform that. Um, and then just to come back to digital innovation and academic services, one of the things that I've talked to each of the leaders of these groups about is, are we taking advantage of all the opportunities to work together, right? So um, I'll just give an example, um, you know, uh, OER services, which is part of the Office of Library and Information Services, of course, has been aware of and involved in the work that we're doing on the DLE. But, um, uh, you know, I think there are many more opportunities to tighten that integration and to work more closely together to help our faculty leverage um, uh, digital content. So that's something that we're going to be working together on. Um, uh, I, you know, we have a task group um, that is working on the learning object repository uh, for um, for Brightspace, and we are we formed that task group uh, to have faculty, staff, instructional designer, and library voices 
in the conversations about how do we want to set that up? How do we want to leverage it? What are the considerations? Uh, and we actually need people from all of those areas of expertise to help inform that, to make sure that we do it well and that it can be can can accomplish um, what everybody thinks it can accomplish in terms of the sharing of content and resources across the system. So, so opportunities to work closely across, even within our portfolio, our organizational boundaries, which can sometimes look like mini silos. So that is coming as well. And uh, uh, I think that's where I'm gonna end. I wanna just um, uh, conclude my remarks by saying, uh, that again, I'm excited about um, this role that I have. I'm excited about the opportunity to continue to work with our campuses and our system team. And, uh, um, and, I, and I hope that you all will continue to think about how and where we can innovate and bring those ideas forward. Even if we're not ready to act on them immediately, we need to know what they are and we need to your help in thinking about how we accomplish them given the constraints, sometimes the timelines, Right. Sometimes the procurement rules that we have to work within, but the ideas it really should be coming from those of you on the ground who are involved in teaching and learning and focused on student success and diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, okay, so that's it for me. Uh, next, I'm really thrilled to be able to introduce Dan Feinberg, um, who uh, is the interim director of SUNY Online. Uh, and has taken the helm of the SUNY Online organization. If you don't know Dan, I know everybody knows Dan and SUNY, but Dan has um, been with SUNY for 13 years uh, um, as part of the SUNY Online team. Prior to that, he spent time at Schenectady County Community College and the University of Albany for about five years. So, uh, so he understands how things work in SUNY. He's very steeped in the SUNY Online organization and he is gonna share uh, some updates from the SUNY Online perspective, and I'm gonna find his PowerPoint. Kim, before you go, we have some questions for you that oh. came through the chat. Okay, yeah, go ahead. So uh, some of these are gonna be related to uh, some of the numbers that Shadi shared. Um, you okay. may or may not have insight to these. I'm, I'm guessing that you do. And some of these may be questions we can follow up with later, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna run through them all for you, okay? Go ahead. Uh, first, uh, we had a question. I would, um, this is more a comment. I would be interested to see how many of the student taking part online, part seated classes would be totally online if they could meet all of their degree requirements with online courses. So it was okay. the numbers that Shadi shared about um, the online students, the, the bar graph? Yes. So you want to know how many of the students who are blending online and face-to-face -face could- And how many, how many of those would be totally online if there was yep. programs to meet their needs? Yeah. Um, so we can definitely, that is definitely a query that we can run that we can answer because we know if students are enrolled in a program that is available all online, we'll know that. So we could actually run those numbers. I'm looking at Dan because Dan could do that. Um, so um, what I will say about that is we have more than 800 programs available online across the system. Uh, so, um, you know, I think what we see is a lot of students who are blending online and face-to-face -face, um, uh, you know, at campuses where they have a wide range of courses available to them. So um, I don't know the number, but we'll find that out. Thank you, Kim. And I know who that came from. So uh, the next question is, in the numbers reported, I am also curious to the number of grad versus undergrad yep. students. Good question. We have that data. We can provide that. I don't have it in my head. All right, and then is SUNY planning on offering more online options for students in the upcoming years? So is, so I'm, I'm, so SUNY system, SUNY online, we don't offer any courses or any programs. So I think that really is a question for the campuses. And one thing that you've all heard me say is uh, at the campus level, what is your strategy for online? Do you wanna grow your enrollments with online or not? So I think this is really a campus question. I think what I would say is there's there continues to be a market opportunity out there of students that can be served online for any campus who wants that to be a key part of their strategy. So that's, I think, not um, a question that that is a, a question for SUNY. I think it's a question for campuses. And there may be 64 answers to that question. Correct. <laughs> um, uh, also, are there number are, are the numbers reflecting unique 
student so that the same student is not being counted multiple times per class? Yes, when we report numbers on students, these are numbers that come from our official um, uh, IR database and are based on serious submissions from campuses. So they're uh, you know, very well vetted. And um, uh, yes, if we're reporting students, it is unique students. If we're reporting enrollments um, uh, um, or registrations, that's based on registrations and courses where there could be um, uh, duplicates. But if we're reporting students, it's unique students. Thank you, Kim. And last question, and this one's more rhetorical, and I think it relates to um, the campus initiatives to um, fulfill the requirements for the DLE, but it yes. was, where are the resources? So um, uh, so I, I, I think what I would like to do is take that question offline. So um, whoever asked that question, I'm happy to follow up on that. Um, I, I will acknowledge that, uh, you know, we, uh, need more resources to uh, complete the implementation and to to be responsive to all the questions and requests that are coming in from the campuses. We did just add a couple of people uh, to the SUNY online team for that purpose, and we are also um, adding additional support um, uh, that you'll be hearing about, um, you know, in the next couple of weeks. So, so yes, we know that more resources are needed. We are adding those resources, and um, uh, yeah, so I'm happy to to talk more specifically. Um, with somebody offline about that, but given that this is a broader than SUNY um, audience, I don't want to get into details. And Kim, hearkening back to your conversation earlier, you did mention that the 200 million might have some money that we could ask loudly for to be directed in that area. Yeah, and you know, again, and I'll, that really speaks to the to the infrastructure and technology pieces of this, but I think the resources go beyond that. Yeah, the resource needs go beyond that, I guess I'll say, yeah. I'm going to check the chat one more time for questions that came in at the end. Nope. I think we're good. So if I missed any questions in the chat, uh, folks, please uh, re-enter re them in the chat and I'll follow up with Kim on it at another time. Thank you, Kim. Thank you so much, John, for moderating that. It's really helpful. Okay, without further ado, here's Dan. Thank you. All right, I'm trying to get the chat here. All right, friends. Are you sure? I don't know. Am I sharing, Michaela? John? No. Can't get the mouse. No, no, no. There you go. So I think it's already. You're in the right side. I, I got to go to Zoom. Zoom. I got you. Share. And it's this one. Yeah. All right. Great. Perfect. No problem. All right. All right. It's all downhill from here. If you want to get rid of this. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah. Ah, perfect. This is easy. All right. Thank you, friends. Thank you for the introduction, Kim. And thank you all for joining us um, virtually and face to face for this. I truly appreciate it. Uh, like Kim said, my name is Dan Feinberg. I am, I have the privilege of being the interim director of SUNY Online. And what I'm talking about today in the brief time that I have is a little bit of what have we been working on in the past year and what are some of the sort of highlights that we're looking forward to coming up, right? So a little bit of looking forward and looking back at the same time. Um, and the danger of going third in one of these things is there's always overlap, but I will try to be efficient in doing this. And I wanted to start by just mentioning the SUNY Online Degrees at Scale effort, which some of you are familiar with. And this was an effort to really serve the educational needs of more 100% online adult learners in New York State. And that was a big piece of you know, what we've been working on for the last few years. Um, this was a huge effort. Right, We knew that there were tens of thousands of New Yorkers going out of state to take online programs. And we firmly believe, still do, they should be going to SUNY. And we, we actually had a ton of successes with this, uh, close to 5,000 students enrolled, over 30,000 applications for SUNY students, um, you know, and a ton of lessons learned. Now, four chancellors later, one global pandemic later, we are, going in a slightly different direction, transitioning a lot of these supports back to the campuses, 
right? But not without a ton of lessons learned about how to recruit students at scale, how to serve adult learners, right? How to um, best support students. And so going forward, we're really looking at capturing a lot of those lessons and incorporating it into our practices. So it really was a great learning opportunity for us that attracted a lot of students that we're really proud of. So a lot of hard work on that initiative. Um, the other sort of tentpole initiative, I think from the last couple of years is the um, digital learning environment migration, the DLE that we're referring to. Um, and Kim and Shadi both mentioned this a little bit, but you know, in the past, if you, when we were here or in New York City three years ago doing this, um, we had five, six different LMSs being used around the system, right? Lots on Blackboard Learn, handful on Moodle, some on Canvas, some on whatnot, right? Through this effort, tremendous amount of effort, um, we're moving all those campuses to D2L Brightspace, right? So the idea of a, a single unified system for this, this is um, taking a tremendous amount of effort, but 56 unique campuses all within our instance of D2L. So this has been a huge effort. Um, Harry is gonna talk about this a lot more uh, later today. If I could cue that up, Harry, I think you're speaking at the end of the day, right? Right, so it's great saving the best for last today. Absolutely. Um, Harry's gonna talk all about where we are with the DLE and um, address those issues. But, you know, we have, we're in the process at this point of migrating just about everybody, right? Whether fully migrated into production or still in the planning and prep stage. But the idea of moving 300,000 students, 400,000 students, tens of thousands of faculty to no LMS in a short amount of time is a tremendous undertaking. Um, in support of that um, has been our SUNY Online Help Desk, of course, right? Um, SUNY Online Help Desk, some of the hardest working people that we have handled 29,000 tickets, roughly 29,000 tickets um, last year. I'll move this out of the way. Um, interestingly, Almost an exact split, 45% students, 43% faculty, right? Which is, I believe, a change. Um, a, the, the momentum has been towards more faculty, right? And um, so this is great, you know, plus another 12% of uh, campus staff. But really, 29,000 tickets in a single year, doing a lot of the grunt work of helping faculty, helping students migrate their courses to the new LMS. Um, now, what are we working on help desk related? Well, providing even more support, right? The goal is to continue to expand and provide more support. We're working with D2L to um, address faculty calls, right? So that no faculty have to hang out on in the queue for too long, right? We are updating the knowledge base. And by we, I don't mean me. I mean, Mike and the uh, hardworking staff on the help desk, but updating the knowledge base, moving away from Blackboard, right? We still have a handful of campuses using Blackboard, but migrating over to Brightspace. So that's been a huge effort. Um, we have an online, we are pleased that we are expanding our online student success unit, right? And a lot of that hard work has come out of some of the lessons learned from the um, DLE, that was a big effort. We are close, right? Close to launching the new student success website that should be up uh, later this month, right? So I'm not totally stealing their thunder, um, but it's gonna have a ton of information about best practices, ton of information about professional development, highlighting what um, people are up to and really providing a go-to resource for online student success right, for practitioners and for students. The other big thing that is keeping that group busy is um, the early alerts community of practice. We have a ton of campuses using um, different early alerts tools, but we pull them all together into our community of practice. It's one of the most active communities of practice, one of, Chris, along with the faculty, of course. Um, <laughs> that is 
They're, and you know, these are just some of the topics that they've addressed. So they're doing a great job with that. Um, the online teaching has been busy as well, supporting a lot of the migration. They've produced, what, eight, seven, eight different, right. Right six plus one. Six plus, well, right. right, different DLE templates, right, to serve all sorts of faculty needs. You, you know, remember a huge part of the DLE is not fully online asynchronous courses, right? So there's a ton of different faculty and different uses of the DLE that we have to reach out to. I know right now they're working on the non-credit ones. And to just say their DLE templates really sells it short a little bit. It is templates, it's FAQs, it's justification behind why they have all these. It's notes explaining what it is. It's all backed in research. It's all based on Oscar. There's a ton there for all sorts of um, whatever course type of course you have, right? Um, they're doing all sorts of quality assurance work to update that. Again, I'm sure we'll hear more about this this afternoon when Harry is talking. But the other interesting thing that Alex and Rob and the SUNY Online Teaching Team work on is this, the DEI Collaborative. And I don't know if there's a presentation on that this week. For the unsession. For the unsession, great. Um, so I'm gonna get a chance to steal her thunder real quick. Um, 60 plus institutions from around the world, right? Working together to add DEI annotations to some of the leading course quality rubrics, of course, of course, the leading course quality rubric, Oscar, and um, a little one called Quality Matters. Um, there's one called Colt. There's a couple of different ones that are involved, but really reaching out to say like, all right, so we know that introducing the instructor introduction is a best practice. Well, what DEI considerations do we have to have for that, right? So really incorporating, this is a central tenant of SUNY, a central tenant of SUNY Online, really incorporating a lot in, of that into what we do. Other things, the communications and community engagement group led by Aaron, led by Aaron um, and Willow doing a ton of work, multiple monthly newsletters, multiple websites that they maintain, right? Multiple social media. They have a brand new TikTok coming out, I think, right? I'm excited. Yeah. Um, over 25 webinars in the past year, um, just doing a ton of work to engage the community of online learners of all types. Um, campus partnerships, which is near and dear to my heart. Um, we have a number of different issues. And Kim mentioned SUNY Online Plus. SUNY Online Plus is one of our ways that we sort of um, ensure best practices at the programmatic level, right? If Oscar is looking at best practices at the course level, SUNY Online Plus is looking at it at a programmatic level. We have about 130 programs right now from 27 different campuses who have SUNY Online Plus designation. Um, we've been doing SUNY Online Plus for I wanna say 10 years um, at least. Um, and it's time to reevaluate some of these standards, right? It, it's a little bit of an eye test. I you can't see that at all, um, but that's okay. Um, it's a lot of, so what these are, these are the seven sort of standards of what does it mean to be a SUNY Online Plus program? And we're revisiting some of that, right? We're pulling together a group. Uh, they're meeting for the first time next month, uh, later this month, thank you. And, um, really looking at is, you know, are, is this inclusive of everything that it means to be the best of SUNY in online learning, right? Um, the other big effort that we're doing related to SUNY Online Plus is recertification efforts, right? Um, there's a number of campuses, Rockland just finished this, Alfred is in the middle of doing this, Broom did a fantastic job with theirs, right? Um, really looking at, all right, it's been 10 years for some of these campuses since you know, we took, we did, you know, since we did institutional readiness, since we did that self-study, since we took a close look at if you're meeting those standards, let's make sure that you still are. Let's make sure that, you know, um, we, let's revisit the quality scorecard. Let's update your best practices. Let's look at where we've been able to close the gaps, look at which have been a little bit sticky and not able to do that, you know, and figure out what we need to do to sort of get over that finish line. So that's been a quality, that's been a great process. We are, if you are at all interested in any of this, um, please reach out, right? Um, we will be reaching out to you too. Uh, if you are a SUNY Online Plus campus and it has been 
um, a few years since you were recertified. So that's exciting. We still have, of course, institutional readiness in the strategic enrollment planning roundtable going strong. Um, FIT is in the middle of doing theirs. Uh, State just finished. Alfred is doing theirs. A um, number of other campuses are still doing institutional readiness. I believe we have around 40 something campuses, uh, mid 40s campuses that have done that. That is sort of a quality assurance at the campus level, right? Um, as well as the strategic enrollment planning roundtable, which is really a, talking to campuses, really addressing that last one of those questions that you got, Kim, about, you know, um, are we going to be expanding online learning into the future? Well, we sort of turn that around and ask the campuses, what is your goal, right? Is your, you know, what are your, what is your enrollment strategy around online learning? Are you looking to just support your on-campus population and sort of, you know, um, ease your physical strain on your classrooms? Or are you looking to expand your footprint? Or are you looking to play defense or some combination thereof? One sec. Um, now, I'm sure that you have heard about exciting programs that you want to be involved with. Um, please, please, please fill out your service level agreement, right? Um, that is available for you to sign. Um, if you do not know who is signing it on your campus, please reach out and we will make sure that you get that. But all of these services are available, many of them for no cost, uh, through the service level agreement. Now, there's no clocks in here, so I don't know how much time. Oh, a pro. Um, now, last thing I wanted to bring up was some of the advocacy work we've been doing around distance learning. And this has been in the news a lot recently, right? Um, this is from, about a month ago, a little less than a month ago, oversight coming for online program providers. Sounds like a great idea, right? Um, rein them in, make sure that everything is going properly. Well, two weeks later, guidance on outsourcing spurs anxiety about collateral damage, right? So the government released a set of standard, a, a dear colleague letter, right? Updating the guidance on online program managers and on what are called third party servicers, right? Um, what does this anxiety about the collateral damage look like? Education department shocks ed tech experts in colleges with expansion of oversight and ed department shakes up OPMs and third party servicers. This is huge, right? Um, this is a big deal, right? And the issue that what we're talking about is that they've expanded the definition of what is a third party service, right? There've always been third party services who sort of helped out. And, you know, um, a lot of it was around financial aid, financial aid support, but they've expanded it to include basically almost everything. Like they specifically name online program managers, tutoring services, retention services, learning management systems, all sorts of things, right? Um, I believe by the new definition of third party service or SUNY online, would be considered a third party service, right? With that comes increased regulation and reporting requirements. And there's a significant um, reporting burden on campuses to identify all of these third party services that you're using. Another rule that was released in the, in the letter, and this is um, you know, still open for comment, was uh, no foreign companies, right? Being allowed to be third party services. So, Kim, can I ask for your opinion on this a little bit about what we're doing to, I know that um, this is a national issue. This is not a SUNY issue, but this is something that we're looking at really closely. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Um, so really important what Dan has on the screen here is that there's an open comment period here through March 30th and people can submit questions and we wanna encourage you. So first of all, if you're hearing this for the first time today, this is something that you should be talking about um, on your campus and making sure that your campus leaders are aware of, because again, it is significantly impactful. The open comment period is really important and we want to encourage you, if you have questions about does something qualifies a third party servicer or not, submit those questions. It's important for uh, um, the Department of Ed to understand where there are questions at the campus level and what the potential impact is. So if you have questions, submit those questions. We had a conversation at system admin yesterday about 
uh, you know, um, you know, what can or should we be doing? And our our best um, guidance right now, and I'm going to be talking with uh, some of the Doodle folks here this week. Um, and I, I know they've already started putting together kind of what does this mean and what are the what is the impact at the campus level? And uh, we want to encourage campuses to um, uh, to comment in the open public period. And we are also considering a comment at the SUNY level as well. Um, and so uh, want you know again, just want everyone to be aware of this right now. Um, it, and and we want to hear from you right as well. Um, what questions you have, what concerns you have, but use those channels with the Department of Ed as well uh, um, to, to bring some of those things forward. Okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense going either way, right? Yeah. Uh, oh. We want individually partner with third party platforms to try to increase our enrollment. The possibility of turning our line coming back at some point. We want to comment in a different direction. Yeah. So, so, um, uh, I think I understand your question, Ryan, and and I think where we're coming from is the perspective of how do we help campuses bring bring their comments forward. Um, we are still talking about what our response is going to be at the SUNY level, um, and so uh, you know we have um, we had a very brief conversation about that yesterday, and I said I wanted to hear from this group, um, you know, uh, um, particularly the directors of online learning, who even though it's not just about online learning, I know this is you know uh, um, in your minds. So we'll talk about it this week and I'm gonna bring that feedback back to system and that will help us frame our response. Does that make sense? Norm, did you have a question? So any issues with space? Well, that's a good question. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that, that's a concern, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and yeah. Yes. <laughs> Pearson is a British company. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to comment, Marianne? Okay. Um, I just think it's really difficult that when um, you know what. Can you come up, Marianne? The virtual people won't be able to. Yeah. Hear you. Thank you. So I, I just think it's really critical. So Kim and Shadi and David Kintoff and I were talk, working on this yesterday. That when Kim coordinates with you or and or will be coordinating also with your um, provost, please, um, please, please, please take an effort to respond. And if you can't respond, go into the FAQ or there's a there's, there's a, a question, question field. Put in substantive questions that are pertinent to your campus. How will this impact student? How would it impact your overall operation? How does it impact your mission to deliver um, to your community or to your constituents? They've got to hear it at that level. Yeah. We'll hit up at the policy level. Yeah. But um, as someone, as one of the um, people you contacted right. yesterday, volume counts in this yeah. game. And they're going to hear from APLU and AACU and AA all those associations, but that's at a very high level. Bring it down to impact. Yeah. How will this uh, hurt or help or or impact your students, faculty, and your delivery? Okay. Yeah. Really, really hit home on that. And and um, if we haven't already, Ryan, I can't remember what we've shared out versus what we haven't. WCET provided some really good guidance around this with um, uh, you know almost a template um, and suggestions um, where you can then just insert your campus specific um, uh, um, perspectives. So um, if we haven't shared that out already, we will, but it, but um, you know that I thought was really helpful. Other questions on that? Great. Kim, hi, John Zelenak. Um, uh, there was one in the chat here that I'm not sure exactly what this was about, but uh, where can we get a comprehensive overview of this information? Is it in the comment link? And I think that is about the, the website where you can add a comment to the docket, but I'm not positive. Yeah, so, um, you know, there's third party organizations like WCET, like UPSIA, who have done a ton of the work around this. Is that, is yeah, that well, question? but Dan, what I, I think the question is where can they go? Like, and we can put a page up on, yeah. on the SUNY online site where we can point everybody to the resources. We can do that fairly easily, right? Sure. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. 
Yep, to learn more about this and how to respond. Okay, anything else? There's nothing else in the chat unless I missed something. If I miss something, folks, please put it back in the chat and I'll resurface it. <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> Pam, this is Michaela. Can you make sure Thank you repeat any questions that the audience is asking so that the online audience can hear it? Sure. People were just, Bob was excited about seeing Aaron's TikTok dances later. Okay. So. I'm excited about you singing the chat. I am. It's coming. It's coming. All right, Alex. I think that's what we got. Thank you all. Okay.